call the meeting to order. Uh, this is the meeting of the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Commission committee meetings today, March 15th, 2012. My name is William L. Brown. I'm chairman of the Wildlife Commission. I'd like to welcome everybody who is here in the audience from the public and members of the agency. Uh, there is a pass, uh, a sheet being passed around for you to sign up. Uh, please, if you're in attendance today, sign your name to the sheet. Uh, we will proceed through the various committees. If you want to address the commission about a specific matter, I'll ask that you wait until that subject or that committee uh, is addressing, for example, if it's wildlife, uh, please wait and hold or do your comments during that time or if it's fisheries during the fisheries committee or whatever committee you want to address. Uh, if you want to address the commission, please come to the microphone in the center of the room, state your name and what you want to address the commission about. Uh, I reserve the right to limit the comments uh, in the event that they become very lengthy or especially in the event of uh, repetitious comments. So keep that in mind. We want everybody to have an opportunity to speak that, that wants to speak, but we do have a pretty large agenda today. Uh, <clears throat> This is the first time that the commission meetings will be, uh, I guess, televised to the public or at least put out where the public can view commission meetings. And uh, we view this as a great opportunity, not only for the public, but for the commission. Uh, one of the things that we've heard over the years is that a lot of people don't have the opportunity to attend commission meetings because of having to work and other reasons. So. This should give everybody an opportunity to uh, see firsthand uh, what was discussed during the commission meetings and what action, if any, uh, was taken. With that stated, we'll go to the Wildlife Management Committee and uh, Commissioner Schuster. Thank you, Chairman Brown. The Wildlife Committee recognizes Gray Anderson, Assistant Chief of the Wildlife Division. <coughs> We all now? Oh, there's well. Okay. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Schuster. Uh, Going to give two talks today, two, two brief presentations. Uh, the first um, is dealing with our wild, our uh, Tennessee white-tailed deer population estimates. And so we, uh, as, a, as an agency, have been shifting gears on how we manage deer and in, in how we uh, deal with our population estimates, deer counts in Tennessee over the last few years. Feels a little loud. Okay. So the question really becomes why after 50 years are we starting to count deer? So what have we been doing? Don't we already know uh, what's going on with our deer populations in Tennessee? And, and when you really look back to it, it's the, the unfortunate answer. Well, I won't say unfortunate, but in today's world, the question, the answer is we ultimately don't know how many deer we have in the state of Tennessee. And that's really what we want to get after. And I say in today's world because in a previous generations when we were in restoration it was pretty much it was okay to understand where your deer herds were going based on harvest data based on some indices and so not exactly where they were with the populations but the trend in which they were going and as long as you had an upward trend we could do some pretty decent management uh, but a lot of this is based on harvest data and the, and the trends give us no estimate of the actual population size they just like I said give us an idea of the trajectory of that population uh, and and it the two common ones that you see repeatedly that, that Daryl gives and, and Chuck will be given in the future years is, is these ideas of, the, of a, the harvest, and the harvest is, a, is an indices. You know, we, we only have rep who's reported those animals. And then ultimately, when we look at uh, harvest structure, it's what they reported. And so and this also takes into account deer or hunter selectivity. And so that's where it gets moves away from an actual population and more of an into an index. Because we don't know, we see those numbers starting to split uh, in our selectivity, our age structure, and we know that is harvest selectivity, that we know that, that hunters are passing over certain age groups and those kinds of things. And that starts to move away from 
uh, an actual estimate, a usable estimate, into some some wiggle, some some uh, noise in our population estimates that we need to we we're trying to remove. So we really started asking the question how many deer do we have? Not what is the trend in our deer populations because as we're starting to see these populations flatten out, we're not getting an idea of exactly how many deer are out there. So we really wanted to start asking a question of how many deer do we have and some of the technologies uh, that we didn't have 15, 20 years ago, uh, even five years ago, uh, as far as cost goes, uh, have really helped us get here. Uh, and then we have a, a, a wild side put together a, a really nice video. I think they, this went out last year about what we do in Tennessee for our deer. Uh, and so we just play this video real quick and then follow it up. It's late on a summer afternoon and we are riding the back roads looking for deer. Ooh, Bob. Two of them. Back up. Back up. This is Williamson County, just a few miles outside Nashville. And even this close to the city, it's amazing how many deer we see. This area that we're surveying now, I'd put it at the top of the list as far as deer habitat within the state. The, the good mixture of open lands and, and forested, you're providing food, you're providing cover, you're providing everything the deer needs. TWRA biologists say there could be as many as 30 deer to the square mile around here and 10,000 in the county. But that is just an estimate and tonight we're going to make sure. So we drove four miles of country road late in the afternoon and we saw 11 deer, seven adults, four fawns. Now we're going to let it get good and dark, go back over that same piece of road and see what we can find. Now we are not just driving around shining a light out the window. We are riding high in the back of a pickup and finding the deer with a thermal imager, a special camera which picks up the heat from the animal's bodies. I had two does, a buck, and then those three fawns that I could tell. Deer tend to be more active after dark, particularly in areas with lots of human activity. But they can't hide from us tonight because any warm body glows bright white on the video screen. Okay, doe, two does, two fawns, and a buck. So we find them with the night scope, then use a regular spotlight and a rangefinder to show exactly where they are. One, two, three, four. Yeah, there's one behind the other one right there. And so far we've seen just in that four mile stretch, 19 adult bugs. Remember, we saw 11 deer in the daylight. On the same stretch of road, after dark, we saw 66, including some which don't usually come out in the daylight. Information from each night's count gets plugged into a mathematical program which determines deer density the number of deer per square mile in that immediate area. Repeated counts like this give accurate numbers, how many deer and where, for each part of the state. It's important to know that because you can't manage the deer population or set hunting regulations unless you know how many deer there are and where they live. And that's one place where Tennessee is way ahead. So many state agencies don't know what that number is. They guess at that number. In the old days, they just count how many hunters checked in. Now that we developed a way to measure it, we actually have a really sound puzzle piece that we could begin putting all those other puzzle pieces together. A study like this one is not something you can do in one night. They go year round, riding the roads, finding the deer, and putting the numbers into a statewide database that TWRA's biologists will be building on for years to come. The winter surveys are done right after hunting season to help determine how many deer survived and you'd be surprised just how many there are. And these nighttime surveys we've been doing for three years now, there's a lot of deer that the hunters just don't see. That, that's the heat signature of a deer. The most recent numbers from this continuing study show that Tennessee has about three quarters of a million deer statewide at the peak time of year, just before hunting season starts. But wherever you are across the state, in an area with many deer or few, the count is going to be more accurate than it is in most other states. Oh yeah, I see the body back there. Partly because of the science, and partly because they're seeing deer that most of us never know are there. There's a lot more to managing the resource than sitting back and putting pencil to paper. We actually get out in the field and, and really try to collect information that tells us exactly what's going on with our research. This is a good night for seeing deer. I'm Craig Owensby on Tennessee's Wild Side.
So that gives us a really good idea of what the process is, you know, and so we, with this new technology, we can see deer that we never saw before, and we can do survey routes that were never re, you know, some of the new technologies, the computers that we can do, uh, computer modeling we can do, give us these technologies that we didn't have uh, 10 years ago. Um, what was done, that was one route in Williamson County, and so one, one night in Williamson County, and uh, it's tough to see here on the, the squiggles here, there are almost 300 uh, 12-mile routes that were identified by our GIS department and our regional biologist uh, scattered across the state. And so and this, what, this is what makes it such an interesting process is we went from uh, a relatively biased hunter survey, you know, based on harvest because, and with all those biases to a random survey across the state that we can really put some scientific bounds on. And so based on these 300 routes, we drove, uh, what is that? 3,700 miles, uh, and so across the state looking for deer, uh, and, and to put that in perspective, this is, uh, you can drive from here to Tok, Alaska, surveying deer, and we took all of that uh, in one year and put it in onto Tennessee's landscapes uh, to get a great sample, and ultimately what we found, overall we have 13 deer per square mile on the, across the state of Tennessee, across all habitats, so that's just a one, one shot look at this. Uh, and we're also finding 565,000 deer, uh, plus or minus 100,000 or so, which is a great difference. You know, for many, many years we talked about, oh, there's a million deer in Tennessee. Well, that was a, a, a guess, you know, and so now we actually have some pretty solid information that gives us an idea of we've got, and this is a post-hunt, so we're taking out 200,000 animals in any given harvest year, add that back. So at the peak of our year, we're looking at somewhere around three quarters of a million deer standing in Tennessee. Uh, and so that gives us some, some quality information. Uh, and the statistics are there. Uh, you don't really have to know what's going on other than we got some pretty good numbers. There's some, some good science behind what we actually have there. Um, breaking it down by region, and these are, these are tiny little numbers. Oops, hope it didn't go too fast. Uh, we can also start looking at uh, regions across the state and the deer densities across the state. And you'll see right there in the middle of Tennessee what the wild side showed us was all of those big pictures, you know, lots and lots of deer. Um, but we're looking at 24 deer per square mile in middle Tennessee, you know, in some of this prime agricultural cattle land. Then you get up into some of the, you know, more out in the croplands, more up into the closed canopy forest, those numbers drop dramatically. But that'll help us as we learn how to deal with these numbers. We're, we're in our infancy. I think the, the wild side gave us a little too much credit a little too early because we're still figuring out how we're going to use these numbers over the long term in our management scenarios. But you can see by these numbers that we have differences in populations of deer across the state of Tennessee. And this is going to help our biologists understand what's going on out there and, and guide management better for the state of Tennessee. So in a summary, we basically we have a first time ever, we have a state population, es population estimate for deer, um, and this is an actual measure, and so with scientific bounds, which gives us some really good information. Uh, we've been working with a, a, a professor over at University of Arkansas. He was one of Mike Kennedy's at the University of Memphis. One of his students is how we got it with the University of Arkansas professor, uh, but has been, he's helping us look deeper in these numbers. And so he, he's asking, he's got some graduate students digging deeper into this and are going to corroborate what we have. And so they're looking some finer, tune thing, finer tuning on this, but everything he's showing is coming up within a couple thousand deer of what we have on the ground right now, of, of our current estimates. And the other thing is, is very interesting is that other states are starting to look at this because it's relatively low cost. You know, we're, t we're, we're still trying to figure out how we can get this done as cheaply as we possibly can and, and get a solid number. Um, but other states are asking that same question as well. You actually have a number, you know, and most everybody, most other states are, are doing the, the same guessing game that we played for a long time. So a lot of states are very curious about what we're doing and very anxious for us to get some more numbers on the ground. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions about what we're doing or what we intend to do with this. Thank you, Gray. Um, before I ask for any questions, could you make sure all of us get a copy of some of those statistics and the map, that PowerPoint? Sure, sure thing. It's well, well done. Sure. Um, anybody else have questions? Gray, what do you know or estimate is the population being replenished through the breeding process? In other words, those animals taken out every year by hunting, is that pretty much being recovered? And 
Most likely, yes. I mean, so I mean, based on those indices, we're seeing no indi no I, no indication that those populations are, are shrinking. Almost all of our populations are growing. We'll need to replicate this, you know. And that's one of the things we're trying to figure out is how often we need to replicate it. And so, like wild hogs, kind of got in our way of our 2000. We didn't do it this year, but we probably in, we're anticipating doing it every other year anyway. Uh, so when we get another sample, then we can really look at the change in that actual number. But everything we're seeing in our deer numbers uh, indicates that we have, uh, at best, you know, or at worst case scenario, a stable population, and in a lot of cases, we still have growing populations. Are you doing research to see what the quality of the herd is as far as buck doe ratio and that sort of thing too? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, the work that was done here in this was, was done um, wintertime surveys, and so the antlers aren't glowing. Well, no, that wouldn't have, that would have been a summertime survey. So those, and so they must have missed, I didn't think about that. They misrepresented it a little bit. Uh, but when the, when the antlers are in velvet, they glow. And so in the summertime, when you're doing the summertime surveys, you can get a really good buck to doe ratio. And what we're seeing is it changed dramatically our buck to doe ratios or the assumed buck to doe ratios. And so, and it's much, uh, much closer to a, Excuse correct me, two to one, three to two and a half to one, somewhere in there, you know, where some of the initial numbers people were throwing out were seven and eight to one, you know, because the hunters were, that's what they were reporting. And now we actually have some, some good estimates of that ratio. And so we're, we're getting some of that additional information. And, and a lot of this, we're just going to have to see how we move forward with it. You know, this, this was, we had a pilot study, and then we had one year of implementation. Uh, and so, and I think we're going to see uh, what, we need out of this and ultimately what all it can give us. So I think we're gonna be asking some hard questions over the next few years about uh, how much and what, what's the quality of the information we can get out of this. Gray, are you gonna, are you gonna use this study in future years to kind of pinpoint deer season? I mean, in certain areas, if we need to have more hunts in one area or another based on these numbers or yeah, we can. And so the biggest issue with, with this method right now is, is scale, is how, how big of an area can you sample and still measure a difference between years. So if we went up in your part of the world, you know, could we do it on a county level? And, you know, the, the problem is the same intensity of these, not to get too technical, but if you're trying to sample uh, a county, the, you could almost, you could sample five counties with the same intensity and get a very similar answer for the larger county than the small. Uh, but the, the biggest question for us is um, how do you make those comparisons? And, and we will, there are counties that we were very curious in, you know, that we may want to put some heavy intensity for a couple of years to see what's going on. And then if we really see a difference in those areas, then yes, we could actually change some regulations. Uh, um, but it, it does give us, and the good part about this is it'll give us a quantifiable measure between those years that is statistically defendable and all, the, all that good stuff. Uh, the question then becomes, what is the scale at which we want to man manage, you know, on, on those small populations? But it, it gives us a lot of information that we never had before that is not just gut feeling, you know, that we feel it's going this way or that way. And so it gives us some defendable numbers to play with. Anyone else? Anyone from the audience have a question for Gray? All right. Gray, do you want to move on to the Black Bear Survey? Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, the other thing I'd like to talk about today is, is a public opinion survey for black bears. Um, and this is, uh, we, here's an executive summary. And, and Daryl put that, I think that's, uh, that text covers what is presented in here pretty decently. We're kind of, this was a several hundred page document. We're trying to just skip across the top uh, of, of what we're doing here uh, and, and give you an idea of why we're doing it and, and then ultimately what we've learned on this. And this sort of uh, is, a, is a product of what we do know about bears. And what we do know about bears is bear populations are increasing and sort of falling back on the same thing we were talking about with deer. Uh, we basically have long-term indices that tell us what's going on with the bear population. And so we have the harvest indices and then we have the bait stations, both of which give us strong indication that the population is continuing to grow. And so, um, and then the other part is we are seeing the range expansion. So not only are the populations within uh, the traditional bear areas growing, and so that, going back to that bait station, the bait station index, it's getting, every, there's so many bears that are hitting those bait stations that it's ceased to be a usable inf piece of information to, to watch it grow because there's so many bears. So we're seeing those types of things as an increasing population. 
but then we're starting to see the expansion. And so uh, we're seeing the Cumberland Plateau. You know, we're starting to see bears regularly on the Cumberland Plateau. Uh, and then we have these single events, these transient bears, probably juvenile males just out wandering. And we had one a couple years ago do a loop around Nashville and, and come back. Had one come up into the Memphis area out of Alabama, Mississippi. Uh, and so we're starting to see uh, bears not only in Tennessee, but from other states. Uh, th these populations are starting to grow. So that's what we do know. What we don't know uh, is how the public feels about black bears. And so now that we're starting to see we, not only the traditional bear areas, but we're starting to see bears potentially show up in every county. We had that one, what year was it that came, the Arkansas bear? Three, four, five years ago? And so, but there, so we're starting to see just about any county in Tennessee could have a bear in it. And so uh, most, of the, most of it is transient, you know, bears. And so, but they're there. So our big question is, what, is the, what does the public feel? Do they want them? Um, are they causing problems? And then ultimately, based on this social information that we're hoping to get out of this survey, what do we want to do uh, as far as management goes? So to get this, uh, we reached out to a, uh, a, a human dimensions you know, people that do public opinion surveys for wildlife, they do this as, as their primary business, uh, and ask them to do a survey for us to gauge public opinion about bears in Tennessee. Uh, what they sent out in early January, we, uh, 1,285 residents were polled, uh, and we used phone surveys, and those phone surveys included uh, not only your standard uh, home phone, but also cell phones. And so we, we, we feel they got covered pretty decently. Um, and let's see, yep. And yeah, here we go. Here's on the, this is how we broke it down. And the things, the areas that we were really look, looking for, those 1,200 people that, that were taken uh, as a survey, uh, there were about 400 of those from each of these areas. And so we, we had the established areas that we've had traditional bears uh, uh, for a very long time, um, the establishing areas. And so that's sort of that plateau where the bears are starting to show up regularly, but not nearly at the densities of, of the traditional bear areas. And then uh, the non-bear areas are where we have these transient bears. And so the base questions were, how do people deal with this? And, are, and, and do people have differing opinions about bears in each of these areas? Do we need to have different, differing management because of these differing opinions? Uh, and so that's really what we're going after, is how do we manage bears? How do people want us to manage bears across the state of Tennessee? And the thing, and, and I'm as guilty as anybody, the, the, what this survey showed me opened my eyes is that no matter where you were in Tennessee, the public opinion about bears was consistent. So from Shelby County to Washington County, the opinions in almost every case were consistent on how people thought about bears, which was very surprising to me. And so, because I expected the non-bear people to have a little more trepidation about bears coming to their areas, but we saw some very, very different things. But across the board, um, very, very similar. So getting into a few of the results, uh, the opinion of the black bear survey or the black bear population in Tennessee. And so what we found is, is, a, is a majority thought it was about right. And so, and if any case, the people that found it too low were in a majority over the people that found it too high. So at this point in time, people are okay with where our bear populations sit in Tennessee at this time. And very few people thought we had too many bears. And so a very low percentage of the people had thought we had too many bears in Tennessee. And then if you ask the simple question, do you support or oppose? And you're looking at a strong majority. You know, 57% of these people strongly supported having bears in Tennessee. 87% were supportive of having bears in Tennessee with a very low majority in opposition to having bears in Tennessee. So the idea of having bears in Tennessee is a very positive thing from residents across the state. Uh, the interesting part, uh, and this, this goes to some of the things we're going to are going to cause some, not concern, but how we manage, is that people really liked having bears and they wanted bears in their county. They wanted bears close to them, but they didn't want bears in their backyard. So we have this relationship of we want bears, but we want bears over there, you know, and so that creates some management issues, you know, about how we deal with bears and, and, and damage uh, and, and bears that cause problems. So, so while they do support it, they do support it in their area, they do support it, they do not support it in their backyard. Um, 
just if people have seen black bears, just over half the people across the state have seen a black bear in Tennessee, which was surprising. So, um, and then how they respond to that, did, was it positive or negative? Overwhelmingly a positive experience. 84% of these people thought it was a positive experience to see a bear with only 3% that had a negative response to seeing a bear in Tennessee. So we had 600 people see a bear in Tennessee. Uh, and only a few of those people thought it was a negative experience. So uh, over, overwhelmingly positive experience for bears in Tennessee. And then going, and this, this dealt with only people that were in the, tradi the traditional bear areas and the expanding bear area. Have you reported damage in the last two years? 1% of these people had bear damage in their area. So you're talking about 600, uh, no, 800 people and 1% of those people had, had problems. So it's a, it's a very low number uh, that are having problems. Most of the problem was agriculture, you know, and so dealing with crop damage, uh, orchard damage, uh, and some livestock damage. And so uh, the problems are very clear uh, where, the, where the problems lie in, in this respect. But again, very, very small sample size in the, in the people that we actually contacted in, in this. Um, and then interestingly enough, we asked the question about bear feeding, and this, this kind of goes back into the whole idea of bears close to people, and we didn't ask them if they had a problem with bears close to them in this question, but do you want to feed bears? And is bear feeding okay? And overwhelmingly, again, large majority, 71% disagree with the idea of feeding bears. And so they want to leave their bears in a natural environment uh, and, and not really any strong agreement that we should allow bears uh, or allow people to, to feed bears in Tennessee. And a, sort of a follow-up to this question is uh, getting at should people change their behavior? And 90% of the people believed that if you've got bears in your area, requiring a bear-proof trash container is not an unrealistic request. And so, and that is gonna get at the idea of really trying to solve the problem for those urbanized areas, for bears that are frequenting trash and that kind of stuff. So uh, it, really, it really shows uh, that, you know, with 7% opposition to actually us changing our behavior, large majority of the people believe that we can change our behavior to look, coexist with these bears in these areas. And then just getting at the sometimes hard to answer question, how do you think we're doing with bears in Tennessee? And a large, large majority of the people believe we're doing a fine job. And, and so uh, of the fair or poor people that, that said we're only doing a fair, or poor, fair to poor job, only 1% of those people believe we were not doing a good job uh, managing bears in Tennessee. So overall, uh, people believe we're doing a pretty decent job as we stand right here with bears in Tennessee. Then getting into the opposition, what do we do as far as management and asking the questions on hunting? We're dealing with just over 50% of the people uh, uh, believe we should hunt bears in Tennessee. And then, but the interesting part of this is if you ask, educate them a little bit and sort of say, if we monitor these bears, uh, will, are you comfortable with us hunting? Those numbers change dramatically. And so once people understand that it's not just unregulated killing, that it is a managed harvest, it goes uh, up to 73% of the people in Tennessee support a managed bear hunt. And so I think that overall that is a, that's a very fine number for dealing with bear and bear management in Tennessee. So the implications of this uh, is it really gives us some solid information, really opened some eyes for how people are dealing with this, with or want to deal with bears across the state of Tennessee, helps us develop our long-term goals, helps our regional biologists understand better what's going on in their backyards. Uh, and so it, it, it kind of changes some gears and starts asking the, the continued protection and management for, for current bear populations. Um, and these are things we'll have to hash out, but overall people in Tennessee really want bears uh, in, in all counties at this point. Uh, but again, they don't necessarily want bears in their backyard. So it, it puts us in a, a differential management. We're maintaining high bear densities away from people, you know, and really not having, you know, too much interaction or trying to minimize that interaction. And this goes into that bear conflict. And what we did see very uh, clearly here is that we as an agency probably need to put some management effort on this uh, bear human uh, interaction and really try to figure out how do we minimize that experience? Uh, what do we need to do on the front end as these bear ranges are expanding to help minimize those, those issues? And this also leads us into we as an agency as a whole, and these are just ideas that are being tossed out, may benefit from exploring regulations that uh, deal with how people unnaturally congregate bears. And so this, this is a, if you don't recognize it, maybe a Eastern 
city that's famous for having a lot of bears. <laughs> but we, ha we, in many ways, create a lot of our own problems. And so what this survey told us is that people are willing to change their behaviors. We may need to help regulate that to help people deal with bears in, in, in their backyards uh, as we move into the future. So overall, everybody liked what we're doing. We had high marks on our management. Um, but we're also seeing that our bear management strategies may need to change. And so as we have these varying densities across the state, we may need to change how we manage bears across the state. And, and so, and ultimately, uh, it's going to be important to continue to monitor this public opinion. How do people want to deal with bears in all counties in Tennessee? And then armed with not only the biological information about the, the growth of the bear population, but also on the social side of how people want to deal with bears, how they really personally want to handle bears in their region, uh, I think we can get together, put together a quality management plan that takes into both, both of those things into account and, and provides a quality product in the future. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Gray. Uh, will the survey results be posted on the website, or is that something that you guys are just working on right We're now? We're working on that right now. So right now, what, what is, is a technical report, and so um, that will have the survey attached to it, and then how we get the public dissemination, we're still hammering out, because it's a very lengthy report with one graph on each page, and so we're trying to, to figure out the best way to give that information without it just being an overriding burden. But we'll be happy to provide it as needed. Okay, thank you. Any comments from the committee? Yes. How accurate is the bait station survey as far as normal population? Uh, the, the bait stations are, are going to be in indices, so they're going to give us information on trends. And so is the population going up or down or stable? Uh, the problem with the bait stations that are, we're running right now, or we were now we're running them every other year, I believe, um, is they've reached saturation point. And so where they're getting hit at such a high rate, you can't tell what the population is doing. So uh, that, at that point, those bait stations have ceased to give us good information. If we had bait stations in some of the other areas or some other metric, you know, some other index outside where the population is still growing, uh, then I think we could see what, what's going on. Do you have any other plans or any other ways that you can monitor the bear population other than the bear stations? We're working on that. And so we, we've, we're implementing a, a population uh, study around the Big South Fork. And so uh, Region 3 and Region 4, Region 4 primarily are putting together this survey, which will give us some, our first population estimate. It's a very different method than we're using for the deer, but it will give us a, a scientifically defendable number for the bears in that area. And then that'll give us our first small area snapshot of what's going on with bears in that in that region and then we're going to be exploring how can we ex expand that up to give us some long-term information so we're we're working on it but we're this one's a little behind where we are on the deer issue at this point but we're, we definitely want to find out what's going on and see it as a very a, a very big need you know to watch that population grow over time with the mass crop being what it was last year, was there a lot more depredation permits granted in Region 4? Shady in those areas? Uh, what I heard was we had 350 complaint calls in the region. Uh, I didn't get a number on how many were that we issued depredation permits. For. Was that an increase? Yes. Because I mean, that's a pretty good survey of how many bears we have, too, but just because. To me, I liken it to like Canada geese mm -hmm. because people want them and they want to see them. But once they're in their yard, then you're going to get a lot of, then you're going to have a management problem. Because, I mean, like the area we have, we can't even have bird feeders up. They just destroy them overnight. So, I mean, they're, you know, they're, there are different species that we're dealing with because they can be so destructive and people are scared of them. Right. And, and I think those are going to be the hard questions. You know, that little graph, if you couldn't tell, Daryl put these together. So the little bear leaving the woods and going to the, going to the house, those are going to create conflicting management goals for us. You know, is, is we, the people want bears, but they only want a certain number of bears. You know, they may have a tolerance level that we have to kind of figure out what that social carrying capacity is for bears and then deal with, with bears in Kingsport, you know, and, ha and how people feed bears, you know, and, and how people you know, we leave in accidental food, you know, via garbage or, or intentional food versus bird feed. That's what I'm saying is that, unfortunately for the bear, when they get to that point and people are not keeping their garbage up, they're putting bird feeders out, then that's hard on the bears because then they want them destroyed. Right. And it's just, 
you know, it's, it's going to be a management right. issue. Right. And that's, I think that's a lot of these conclusions that we're running through are, are just, I think, long term things for us to think about. But I think some idea, you know, we've, you know, Dan Gibbs has been beating his head against the wall with this bear feeding issue, you know, because it creates problems at times, you know, and, and so you have some individuals that are allowed to do it and some and, and they're creating problems for maybe neighbors and stuff like that. That and looking at this, maybe we and that's I think the long term implication or the, that we're alluding to is we may need to do some things that work on the social issues, not just the, the biology of this. We typically think of management as a bio, biological thing. What we're seeing here is, is maybe we should really expand our social thought and how do we deal not only with the person that has the bear, like it or not, on their property, but also what is their liking it or not liking it impacting their neighbors and, you know, and the population as a whole. If they're feeding them Krispy Kremes and the bears are constantly coming in to that one yard to get Krispy Kremes, that's going to impact that bear and also the people around that bear. So how we handle the legalized feeding of Krispy Kremes may be something we want to think about. Any other questions from the committee for the commission? <laughs> well, I, it's not a question on this. I just wanted to kind of give some appreciation to Gray for coming down. I had a, a, a Tennessee Conservation District meeting, and he came down and helped explain to all of those what TWRA was doing to assist the conservation districts and the water quality management and everything in the state. And I really appreciate you taking your time to come down and do that. Yeah, thank you. Anytime. Are there any questions from the audience? All right. Uh, Gray, I just want to tell you, too, how much we appreciate all the efforts you guys and your team did to put together the presentations. Tell Daryl we really appreciate it. Yep. And um, um, it really helps us when it comes for us to making those decisions. So Happy to help any way we can. Thank you so Thank much. You. Commissioner Griggs. Thank you, Madam Chairman. In consideration of the staff's presentation at our upcoming April meeting, which will be addressing various wildlife and hunting season issues, as well as updates associated with the control of wild hogs in Tennessee, motion is made to direct staff to include the following specific items. Number one, readdress the current limit of non-family designees as related to wild hog control efforts on large acreage tracks. And two, in state no less than a 10 day period whereby the state will partner with the public in, in its wild hog control efforts on the Catoosa WMA and other WMAs as deemed appropriate. This period would allow for the use of dogs by the public in their assistance to the agency. I might add three notes. A, providing the opportunity to additional designees is reasonable, given the varying track size that hogs occupy within the state. B, the involvement of seeking public assistance in the control of wild hogs at Catoosa is consistent with the agency's goals and objectives. And finally, C, it is appropriate for the staff to recommend how this period is implemented, including the 10 days not necessarily being consecutive in consideration to WMA's other activities and seasons. That's my motion, Madam Chair. Second. Is there any discussion from the commission? I'd like to say one thing. I agree with exactly what we're going to do, but do we know what the, uh, the the status of the agricultural bill concerning the transportation of hogs now is that a, a is that a is that something that's going to happen in your opinion? Well, the, the, the status of it is right now it's uh, in the House Environment Conservation Subcommittee. It's in the Senate Energy Committee. It's on the calendar for next week. Uh, feel very positive about it. I, I can't make any guarantees. Uh, I, I, I do feel very positive about the outcome of, of that uh, transportation, illegal transportation bill. Though. I think it just goes hand in hand, but we want one with the other, correct? <coughs> correct. Thank you. Madam Chairman, I, I think that, and I'm sure this has been conveyed to the legislature, I think that bill is critical in the agency being able to manage the situation that exists at this time. Madam Chairman, I concur with the motion and, and, and hopes that it passes and we get to vote on it tomorrow. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, you're right. We need that bill to partner with us to make this, this step work for all concerned. So uh, I echo the encouragement that the uh, transport bill passes with. Thank you. Director Carter, would you like to make some comments or? Thank you, Chairman Schuster. I do have just a couple of things, if, if you don't mind me addressing one or two things in, in general. First of all, uh, you should remember when we first went into the hog regulations that, that we know today, uh, it was done very quickly, and there were circumstances that dictated that we had to do that. That's outside the norm of what we like to do. We really like to vet our regulation process through the season setting process that we normally go through with, look at all the data and all the other things that go with that. When you, when you have 169 management areas and a whole bunch of other public property, not to mention all the private property, it has such a ripple effect when you change things sometimes and, and you don't have the time to go through and look at each one of those and see what effect it has on other hunts or other activities that are taking place on the management areas or on private land. So to begin with, I, I say thank you for uh, making sure that we had that amount of time to go through the regular process and to come back to you in April when we preview the things ordinarily and then if things follow as, as norm you would take action on that probably in May. So it gives us time to look at that whole circumstance and, and we're appreciative of that. I also wanted to mention to you that I've met with a number of people across the state uh, individually and as organizations as well uh, as where we are on these particular regulations. Uh, Y'all have come back and tweaked them since they first went in. You've changed things that went along to try to comply with, with input from the public and from other bodies, from the legislative bodies, from, from local uh, communities, from the county commissions, and anybody else that had something. I know you've listened to them and you, you've changed things, for instance, on the number of persons on a lease and all those kind of things that you've changed. And, and we want to make sure that, that we are responsive to that. But, but when we went into it so quickly, the thing that I've told a lot of the people that I've met with is that we never intended to be on the side where people who hunted thought that we had some problem with, with hunting of wild hogs other than in the concept of what we first outlined when we went in to try to get some control over wild hogs. Uh, there's no secret as to what a destructive animal they are. And we know across the United States and especially in the southern states, it's a battle that's ongoing. It's cost millions of dollars. It has a disease aspect to it and on and on. Not to belabor that because you know all those sides, but those are the things that, that we were trying to address. And it, it left two perceptions with some people. Those people really liked to hunt hogs. For some reason felt that the organization that had backed them for years as being a, uh, something that we liked and promoted and that being hunting, which I've done for my entire career and so has the agency, the last thing I wanted to do was see those people thinking, hey, these guys are, are not standing with us right now. But we had to implement a lot of things very quickly, and, and that's what we did. The other perception was as it dealt with dogs. And I've had this uh, comment from several different organizations and individuals as well, the, the agency and the commissioner are both moving toward ways to get rid of using dogs in hunting, period. And I know from the number of you that have dogs that you utilize when you hunt, and from the agency in general, that, that that's, couldn't be farther from the truth. But it was true where it, it dealt with hogs. And there were, there were really two reasons for that. One was that we had a lot of complaints from the ag community, those, those private landowners, that when persons were using dogs, they were running them off of our management areas or uh, onto their private land where maybe they didn't have a problem quite so much before, but the, the dogs were pushing them off onto their land. Then we also had it from one landowner who was saying they're pushing them from one private land to another. So we were trying to address that. And then there's the other side of that was the movement of hogs. And if, if you are, as you already said in your comments, that has been one of the driving factors in this whole thing is that we know that hogs are so prolific that it takes just a very few to make a huge impact on the number of animals that are in one area. And if you don't have a problem in some areas with either no hogs or very few, it only takes a very few sows to change that whole complexion of that landscape. So we were trying to address that and saying, we want to make sure we don't disperse hogs off of our land to someone else. We want to make sure that that we don't encourage transport from one side of the state to another or from one area to another. And it's sad that 
we recognize wholeheartedly that not everybody in the hunting community does that. And, and I'm convinced that it's very few, but it takes so few that it makes a huge impact. And that's why the dogs got wrapped up in this whole thing. So I kind of went through that whole scenario just to let you know that the agency has been considering where we are, where we, what we can do to, to tweak or to change the regulations that we're in now. Uh, as, as the staff looked at what might happen in the legislature, and if in fact the penalties are significantly increased for the movement of hogs from one area to another, and it deters that from those few people that would like to do it, we have every opportunity now to come back and look at the whole picture and see what we can do to regulate the control of hogs, but at the same time allow the public to be a great assistance in removing those hogs where they're a problem. So if we can address both of those things by utilizing the people that do want to hunt them or to help us control them, we would use it as a control measure, and that would be what we'd be looking for. Help us get rid of these hogs on those areas where we know they're a problem and to keep them from spreading in other areas. We, we've begun talking about that already, and we hear exactly what you've directed us to do. Uh, we're fine with that. We'll go back and, and look at that and come back to you with the most sound regulation that we feel like we can come forward with and recognize that you have every opportunity and every right to change that to what you feel is most appropriate from both the political and private input that, that we'll gain through the season setting process. So I just ended up by saying we understand. We're ready to look at, at changing our regulations in, in the face of perhaps a greater penalty for those people who would misuse it and also to know that we'll come back through a a, a, thought, a well thought out process to give you that best regulation that we can. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Director Carter. Are there any questions from the audience? Chairman? I just want to echo uh, what Director Carter said about the uh, dog hunting. I've had several calls personally from people around the state that, that there is a movement uh, by the commission, by the agency towards doing away with all dog hunting. And I have tried to assure everyone I've talked to that nothing could be farther from the truth. The commission recognizes and agrees with the houndsman heritage, if you will, over the years, what has been passed down through the generations. And uh, I think we can assure uh, those people that utilize dogs in whatever uh, type of hunting they do, that it is not the intent of the commission or the agency to eliminate dog hunting. So hopefully uh, this uh, information will be spread throughout the public and whoever is uh, either starting those rumors or, or uh, adding to them will understand that there is no truth to those rumors. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Those in favor of passing this motion, uh, say aye. aye. Those opposed? <clears throat> the ayes carry and the motion carries. At uh, this time, we'll go to the Fisheries Management Committee and Commissioner McMillan. Thank you, Chairman Brown. We're going to ask uh, Chief Bobby Wilson to come up for a couple of presentations. Thank you, Commissioner McMillan. Passing out the, uh, the Angler's Guide to Tennessee Fish. I just want to tell you a little bit about this. We just got it. Uh, it's kind of hot off the press. We Maybe two or three weeks ago, we received a shipment of about 60,000. And um, about 10 or 15 years ago, we used to have one that was a slick publication, sort of similar, but not nearly as nice as this. And uh, we, we couldn't reprint it because the plates for the fish individual pictures were deteriorated uh, beyond use so we had to we just had to for the in, the in the interim we used another type that was kind of a generic fishing guide or a guide to anglers excuse me a, a guide to Tennessee fish and and it was okay but it just it wasn't really what we wanted so uh, this one has been in about three years in the making and um, pretty much started from scratch one of the unique things about it is most of the pictures taken were taken by our own TWA personnel folks 
and that's why it took a long time to do because it took time to get uh, the different individual species of fish. There's about 315 or so species of fish in our state, and I think there's about 100 in here, so we cover about a third of them. Um, there's so many little darters and and uh, minnows and things like that that we didn't want to try to cover all that. We just tried to cover the ones that we felt like anglers were more likely to encounter. Um, we wanted to also develop this guide that might be useful for anglers, not just trying to see what they're going to catch, but also uh, maybe as a preventive measure for spreading fish around where they're not supposed to be. On the, towards the very back, I believe it's on page 42, there's a section on the aquatic nuisance species. And in it, there's a, it shows the difference between, for example, the Asian carp, like the, the big head and the silver carp, so that unfortunately anglers are starting to encounter more and more and they'll, they'll be able to identify them at least, know what they are. And on the page uh, 46, there's a, there's a little poster kind of thing that shows the difference between the juvenile silver carp and big head carp and the gizzard shad. And that's as a preventive measure so that <clears throat> folks that go out and maybe catch, they may catch some of these with a cast net, they won't <clears throat> accidentally release them, to a, release them into a body of water where they don't exist. So, and one other thing we wanted to do was um, on page 51, there's a, the northern snakehead. It, there's a diagram showing the difference between the bowfin, which is native to Tennessee, and very similar in a lot of ways to the snakehead. And, and because of the publicity that the northern snakehead has received in the last few years, we've been covered up with phone calls from folks that have been catching bowfins and thinking that they're snakeheads. So uh, and that's a good thing. At least the public is aware of the, of the potential of it. And, and today we don't have any northern snakeheads in our state, but <clears throat> I think they're coming because they're across the river in Arkansas. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to bring this to your attention. I, I'm very, we're very proud of this publication. It's also on the on our agency website, and we're looking into the possibility of maybe having it on an app. I don't know. It's <clears throat> it's just kind of a new idea, so that if a an angler with a smartphone is fishing, they can just press it, and if they catch a fish, they don't know what it is, and they can look it up on their on their phone or their droid or whatever. Um, one other thing is that a little bit of credit. I'd like to take all the credit, but I don't deserve it. But there's a lot of folks that uh, put some time and effort into this. Uh, all, nearly all the fisheries folks did. Uh, of course, there's some credits on the front to, uh, to Raleigh Holtum in our INE division, a very talented graphic design person who, who put a lot of time into this, and he gets a lot of credit. Uh, and a few, I won't name all the fisheries folks who took pictures, but one other guy who didn't get any credit in the book and probably deserves more credit than anybody is Mike Bramlett. And Mike doesn't know this, but he's, he's back there. Stand up, Mike. Come on, stand up. <laughs> All right, he he deserves, he put a lot of time and effort into this, and he didn't even put his name in there, and that's one thing I was mad at him about. I didn't realize he didn't give himself credit, but that's just the kind of guy he is. You might have any questions on the, the guide. No, I just think it's an awesome uh, guide myself. I know I'll keep one in my tackle box because uh, – uh, like, like I said, I was a little irritated that you put that the LYs were reducing this fish because it's a great bait, but uh, we'll, we'll be all right with that. Now. That's right. So, good. <laughs> it's a great job. Bob. Thank you. Great job by you and all the, all the staff. It's something to be proud of. Really is. Well, one other thing I didn't mention is um, because we put the aquatic nuisance species in the, mag in the back <laughs> area, we were able to pay for a lot of the, the cost of publication of this with the aquatic nuisance species federal grant money. A majority of it's going to come from that, so that's that's going to help us out a lot too in doing that. And we've made, like I said, sixty thousand copies, I think, Mike. Uh, yeah, 70, seventy-two. Seventy-two thousand. Okay. How how expensive would it be to do the app? I don't know. That's a probably a Don King question. Maybe Mike knows. I don't know. Uh, yeah, they're working on it. To see, yeah, still working on that. To see. see what it might cost. Yeah. Is that something we can make money off of? Or I mean, can we sell it or? I don't know if we're, I don't know. Just a public game. That's all. Awesome. Yeah. Any questions from anyone? All right. I'll let you move on. Thank you. Thank you. If I may, I'd like to introduce the next presentation. And if you look in your uh, handy dandy, state of the art, best in the country fishing guide that I just handed out on page 19, it, it's about trout. Uh, 
hang on a second, Travis. Trout are uh, that we have. Uh, there's four species of trout that we have in Tennessee, and really only one of those is the true native trout to Tennessee. We stock, um, we stock them all. We stock the the uh, lake trout, brown trout, and rainbow trout, and they're not native. But the uh, the only native one is the southern Appalachian brook trout. We also stock a brook trout into places like the Candy Fork and the Clinch, but it is a hatchery species. It's probably more of a a northern species, but it's it's not gonna it's not gonna mess up the gene, the genes of the southern Appalachian brook trout. You'll see the habitat is entirely different. Um, but we manage the the other trout species for sport fish, or big fish to catch. They they grow to good sizes. This is a little bit different in that we are putting a trying to reestablish or replenish a, a, a native species back into some of its original waters, its home range. It might have been decimated or eliminated from because of logging practices or or water uh, poor water quality and things like that. So, with that, I want to introduce Travis Scott. Travis has been with the agency for about 13 years. He he spent five years, by the way, as a hatchery manager of Flintville Fish Hatchery. So he's got some trout experience and a trout hatchery experience. And um, he currently serves as a fisheries biologist with the uh, streams crew in Region 3. So take it away, Travis. Thanks, Thanks for having me here today. Uh, as Bobby said, the southern Appalachian brook trout is the only trout native to Tennessee. And their numbers, they were isolated to the mountain areas of Tennessee at elevations typically above 2,000 feet. And those populations have been reduced through uh, unregulated logging in the early 1900s, in the mid 1900s, uh, acid rain deposition stocking of non-native trout species in the streams that the brook trout once occupied and part of TWRA's conservation strategy provides goals and strategies intended to help protect enhance and restore populations of brook trout and to attain the broader goals of the eastern brook trout joint venture the eastern brook trout joint venture is a consortium of the various states that have brook trout up and down the Appalachian Mountains that we are a member of and uh, this is our effort to meet some of those goals of restoring brook trout to their native range. This work at Sycamore Creek achieves these goals of enhancement and restoration. Uh, the brook trout hatchery will also aid in restoration of brook trout throughout their native range, not just Sycamore Creek. Uh, once we refine the techniques, uh, the hatchery, the brook trout hatchery is the only place that uh, Southern Appalachian brook trout have ever been successfully hatched and raised. This is a map of Sycamore Creek. Sycamore Creek is located in the Cherokee National Forest in southeastern Monroe County in TWRA's Region 3. Is there a pointer? Is the air arrow? Okay. Um, uh, this, uh, this is in the, the, the mountainous area. It's near the North Carolina line. North Carolina line is here. Uh, the TWRA's Teleco trout hatchery is here. The brook trout facility is located here at Teleco. Uh, uh, one of the old pheasant field rearing pools was a hatchery building was built on that site to raise the brook trout. This is Sycamore Creek. It's a tributary to the Teleco River. Approximately 3.2 miles of Sycamore Creek is capable of supporting trout. Uh, these flags mark uh, the lower reaches uh, our lower sample sites, this is site one, the site two, and this was site three. Uh, this would be our site four uh, and site five and on up. These lower sites from five down were dominated by a wild rainbow trout population. Um, and the upper reaches, these upper three sites were dominated by the southern strain Appalachian brook trout. Our goal in this project was to remove these rainbow trout and establish brook trout is the predominant species throughout Sycamore Creek. Uh, Sycamore Creek serves as a water source for the brook trout hatchery building and Teleco hatchery itself or Teleco trout rearing station itself. Um, so uh, it was it, never our, been our goal to completely remove the rainbow trout but to remove enough that brook trout becomes the predominant species throughout. 
Uh, Teleco Hatchery itself was built in the late, uh, mid to late 1930s and has been in operation ever since. It started, like I said, as the pheasant field rearing pools, uh, small round pools where they raise trout. Currently, we have uh, uh, two long sections of double raceways where uh, over 50,000 pounds of trout, rainbow trout, are produced to stock in the Teleco River, Sitico Creek, and streams in Polk County. This is our the building. Uh, this building was constructed uh, through funds, uh, federal grants through the Fish America Foundation and uh, U.S. Forest Service, uh, a federal grant from them uh, to construct this building and help with uh, refurbishing uh, inside and uh, uh, purchase of equipment to operate the facility. Uh, the Teleco Hatchery is also a, one of the top tourist attractions in um, the Monroe County area, and, and we have uh, uh, thousands of visitors a year that tour the hatchery and, and see where the trout are grown. There's uh, a big waterfall that people come to see, and they make a trip of it and come on up to the hatchery and, and see what work TWRA is doing there. Uh, on our removal, we, we went to back we can go back to our map we started in August uh, in these upper sites we hiked the Sycamore Trail uh, Sycamore Trail gives us access to the stream but vehicles are not allowed on it so we were forced to enlist a group of volunteer horsemen to help pack our equipment into and out of and our fish out of the stream. So we hiked in the first, our first rainbow removal was in the upper four sites. And we went in in August. Uh, two crews hiked in from the bottom, it's 1.6 miles, and then sampled these two sites, roughly uh, 0.6 miles of stream, and removed rainbow trout and collected uh, the brook trout. And we released the brook trout. We just wanted to see what size groups we had. Uh, and then the upper two sites, they hiked in from a trailhead near Wig Meadow. Uh, it's approximately 1.6 miles down and sampled these upper two sites and did the same thing, removed rainbows and uh, uh, got our size classes on our brook trout. Then we went back in September to these lower three sites and brought the horses in then and they helped carry our equipment in and we um, removed rainbows, and in this section, since we had the help of the horses, the rainbow trout that we removed, there were 800 we removed in this section, these three sections alone. We were carried back down to the Teleco hatchery to a truck, and those fish were stocked in the delayed harvest area of the Teleco River. The, of course, we, we've looked at the rainbow numbers. This is a picture of our pack horses carrying our equipment in. They were a big help and really tremendous. We had a lot of help from uh, Trout Unlimited and some other volunteer organizations, including the backcountry horsemen that helped make this possible. As you see, the stream was very steep gradient. It's difficult to wade and sample, and it took a lot of help to get equipment and fish in and out. Um, on our Electro fishing results, a total of 521 brook trout were collected in all reaches of the stream sampled. Uh, 1,114 trout were removed. And like I said, 800 of those went to the Teleco River. It wasn't feasible to remove the trout from the upper area in the first collection. Uh, rainbow trout dominated the lower five sites and brook trout were predominant in the upper three. Our goal is to have brook trout, the predominant species, all the way down into the lower reaches. Um, as part of the sampling in September, we were collecting brood fish from the very upper site uh, to be used in the hatchery to spawn. We collected females. These fish, the biggest fish there is approximately nine inches. These fish typically are small. Uh, they're limited by the amount of food in the, the water. They're generally non-productive, not very productive, and so they're and they typically have short lifespans, three to five years, um, most, most in the three-year range. 
and this was the male. The males have a spectacular coloration in the fall. These are fall breeders, and that's why we went in in late September to collect the broodfish. Uh, that's when they're getting close to their spawning time is in the fall as opposed to many of our other game species. Um, 38 females, 31 males. Um, we started spawning on October 13th. The first fish were ripe at the hatchery facility. This was the holding tank where we kept the brook trout. They were separated by sex when we brought them in. Uh, we checked the females, uh, the first spawn October 13th, the ones that were ready. Uh, we were just using our hands to squeeze the fish and if the eggs came out, we put them in a pan and then we would get the males and uh, uh, rub along their belly to extract the sperm and mix the two uh, to complete the spawning process. Um, that first spawning, we noticed that there were some issues. There was a low amount of sperm present in the males, so we returned October 18th and gathered more males to help uh, increase our odds of fertilization because of the low amount of sperm present in the males. Uh, altogether, we spawned on October 13th, uh, 19th, uh, 26th, and November 3rd. Uh, it was spread out over a long period, and in the end, only 27 females actually released any eggs for spawning. Um, and after the fish were spawned, they were placed in these heath tray incubators. Uh, water flows in from the top from tray to tray, and the eggs stayed in there. It took till November 29th for the first eggs started hatching from the October 13th spawn. Um, after this is a picture of our, our eggs. This is, they're just starting to hatch in this yellow spot here. That's the yolk sac that they're living on until uh, they grow up to a larger size to feed. This is, of course, the, the fry. And this is a fry. There's just a little bit of orange left of the yolk sac here. This is about the stage they would begin feeding. Uh, total, um, of the 27 females, we spawned only fish from the first two spawning sessions on the 13th and 19th uh, hatched. Uh, the other eggs from the later spawnings, we didn't have a successful hatch, and we think it was because of the amount of time that the fish had been in the hatchery. Some uh, fish under stress will oftentimes, uh, if the conditions aren't right, they'll begin to reabsorb their eggs, and we're afraid that might have been a factor. Uh, but we did successfully hatch 187. And I know it doesn't sound like a big number, but when you look at the entire stream, we only found, collected 521 brook trout. Um, this 187 is a 35, will be a 35% increase in the number of brook trout in Sycamore Creek. And with the reduction of uh, rainbow trout, we're hoping that the brook trout remaining in the stream uh, will have a better chance of expanding also. These 187 fry will be stocked uh, in the lower reaches of Sycamore Creek where there weren't any brook trout present uh, in our earlier sampling. Uh, the future this summer, we look to do another rainbow removal uh, in August. And after that, we will go in and stock the, fr the fry. Hopefully there'll be fingerlings then, a larger size, advanced fingerling to stock in. Um, the Brook trout hatch hatchery is going to be reconfigured to uh, provide two systems uh, that we can operate. This will allow us uh, more flexibility as far as research and what it takes to be more productive with the brook trout uh, in this facility. And um, um, the, um, pardon me, uh, yeah, reconfigured. Uh, hopefully this will give us a, a more room to do research uh, to determine what needs to be done and increase our capacity and make it a more efficient operation to help restore the brook trout to more miles of stream in a given year. We also anticipate collecting more brood fish from Sycamore Creek to uh, increase the number of spawners this fall and of course we will go through uh, uh, and collect the broodfish and hatch them in the, the hatchery again spawn them and 
hopefully have more fish to stock in Sycamore Creek early next year. Plans are in place to develop a visitor center to inform the public about Tennessee's only native trout and the importance of its restoration. And ultimately, fish reared at the hatchery will help restore the southern Appalachian brook trout throughout their historic range. Um, this project couldn't be possible. We had a lot of help from Forest Service and National Fish Hatcheries of Irwin and Dell Hollow and then the private groups that, that helped out. A lot of advice, uh, financial support, and uh, actual physical labor that made this possible to help reintroduce and uh, enhance and restore the population of brook trout in Sycamore Creek. And with that, I'll entertain any questions. Chairman Brown. Yeah. Travis, the uh, fish, the brook trout that you initially took that you got the eggs from, did you all retain those to try to get them in better shape and hopefully a bigger production? Yes, sir. I meant to point that out. Uh, we did, we have retained those fish. Uh, we've lost very few. Most of the ones we lost were lost init initially after the spawn. It was, and that would be typical in the wild. A lot of times after uh, a large older fish, after it would spawn in the fall, it would die. And we did lose uh, three fish, I think, after that. But we have retained those fish, and they're on site, and they're on feed, commercially prepared feed, and doing well. We've uh, been monitoring their growth and uh, we're gonna hold them until the fall and use them as brood stock again. And we have done some DNA analysis on those brood fish and on the, f we're gonna test the fry when they get bigger so we could identify uh, specific parents. The fish have been tagged and hopefully gain some insight as to, to what it takes to be successful on those spawns. Any other questions from the audience? Well, I think it's an awesome program. I, being from East Tennessee, I, it's a shame to see the brook trout, how they've diminished. I imagine it's challenging with the uh, terrain that you have to undertake to try to restock those creeks. I don't, how did you get those fish out and keep them alive? On the, how, how, how quick were you able to get them out once you recovered them? We, we uh, carried in plastic bags that we filled with water, and then we put the fish in there, and then we pumped oxygen into the bag and sealed it with uh, bands. Uh, and then those were packed out to the, cr to the trail where the horses were waiting. They were packed in panniers and carried up. And uh, once, of course, then they hit the hatchery truck and were brought down the mountain and put in the hatchery. Of course, we acclimated them to the water temperatures. And we had put them on ice to make sure the water stayed cool and the oxygen. As that bag is sloshing around in travel, that oxygen is getting worked into the water. And um, we didn't lose any fish in transportation, either on rainbows or brooks, um, bringing those out. That's awesome. All right, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Chairman Brown. Uh,